Let us pray. Our Father, we are here gathered tonight because we know that you are a faithful God. That your promises will never fail. That your intention and plan for the church today is still the same as your intention and plan for the church of the first century. We're praising you because to us you have given this promise and privilege that if we will approach you with faith, with confidence, you are willing to pour out the Spirit upon the church today as in days gone by. And so, Father, we come before you with all readiness, with all confidence and faith, and we're asking that you pour your Spirit upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know our needs. And you know that this need can only be met as we receive the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. We are praying that the promised Holy Ghost, the Comforter, will come upon us as individuals and as a church in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our understanding today again as we open the pages of the scripture. Help us to see what you want us to have. And as we study, may we appropriate all that you are showing us by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Since we started our study in the book of Acts of the Apostles, the Holy Spirit who inspired the writing of the Acts has been leading us into wonderful teachings from this book. And as I announced earlier on, that we want to plunge into the depths of this book, because it's this book that draws aside the curtain and shows the weak, fainting church the source of power, the source of boldness and strength. It shows, it shows the weak church, or the church that is hiding behind closed doors, the very source of glory and revelation and wisdom. And as we approach this book, we approach this book reverently, knowing that this is the record of what God did with the early church and what he's willing to do with the church today. As we approach this book, we're approaching with open mind, knowing that we have not got all that we expected to get from the hand of the Father. And that there is still an abundance of heavenly treasure awaiting us for our claim as we approach with open minds. As we approach the book, we approach it in a sense with a sense of ignorance and a sense of sincerity, wanting to know what we do not know. Because if we are full and fed up, we come to the table of the Lord and will not be able to receive anything. It's exactly in the same attitude and temper and expectation that the apostles and disciples themselves waited for the event that came on the day of Pentecost. It's with the same attitude and intention and expectation we're coming to the study of the book even this time. And I did say that the Holy Ghost is mentioned more than 40 times in the book of Acts and the Spirit is mentioned more than 60 times. And of course, a book that gives so much attention to the Holy Ghost like that honors him. And we ought to honor him as well. And part of the honor we give to the Holy Ghost is wanting to know everything that comes through him and wanting to receive whatever he has for us as individual believers and as a church. I told you before, and it bears repetition, that when Christ made this promise to the church of the glorious infilling and baptism with the Holy Spirit, the expectation of the disciples were very high. One, because Jesus spoke much in the last days that he spent with them. We call it in theology the Passion Week. He was with them in the upper room. And it was there he began to introduce to them the subject of the Holy Spirit from John chapter 14, all through to John chapter 16. Then he made a, a staggering statement 
And I think the church has never really understood this. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, and this must be the truth. It must be the truth. That it is expedient. That word in Greek means it's good, profitable, and advantageous for you. That I go away. You don't feel like that, do you? You don't feel like it's advantageous that Jesus Christ had gone away. You don't feel it is so good and profitable that Jesus Christ went away. He's no more here physically. We can't see him or touch him or feel him or interact with him or speak to him in the physical. And yet even though you don't feel it is expedient or good, profitable or advantageous, Jesus did say, and this is a real truth, it is advantageous for you that I'm going away. Because if I do not go away, the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. But if I go, then it will come. This raised their expectation. Because they knew that from what Jesus said, better days will come when the Holy Ghost came. Greater days will come when the Holy Ghost will come. They knew that greater miracles will be seen when the Holy Ghost will come and it will abide with the disciples forever. And the same we ought to know today that when the Holy Ghost comes upon us, it will bring you into a better realm spiritually, into a greater manifestation of power spiritually than when the disciples were side by side with Jesus Christ. And because the church over the years has been cheated, that's why we're going through this book very, very slowly. Because the church has been cheated and we have neglected the Holy Spirit. Incidentally, that is not the attitude of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, you hear the mention of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 17, you hear the mention of the Holy Spirit, which means on the first page of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is there. On the last page of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is there. And all the pages between, you have the Holy Ghost working, whether mentioned or not mentioned. And so from the beginning of uh, the divine revelation to the end of the divine revelation, the Holy Ghost has been very, very active. And it's to the loss of the church, to the poverty of the church, to the spiritual lack of the church that the church has neglected him. In the first century of the church, the Pentecost came, the Holy Ghost came, and the church became strong and powerful and bold. Dynamic faith entered into the church, and he never knew any lack. And uh, historians, the church fathers in the early church, they tell us in the second century and in the third century, the Holy Ghost was still in wonderful, great manifestation of power. But then in the fourth century, about the time that Constantine made the church a state affair and he merged and married both politics and religion, and he made the ministers of God to think about the things of the world. And he left the office they should have had in ministering just to the people of God, spiritual things, preparing them for heaven. When the ministers of God left that, they, they lessened their emphasis on the Holy Ghost. And the dark age came. Because you see, when the Holy Ghost is available, there is light. But when you neglect the Holy Ghost, darkness will come in the church. And all through, you just have some smattering few people having knowledge about the Holy Ghost. And the church was plunged into a period of terrible darkness. That went on about uh, the 12th century. When an individual started reading the Bible again and he saw about the Holy Ghost. But he couldn't see much because the whole light had been lost until the time of uh, Martin Luther. But the only revelation they could get at that time was justification by faith. But you know the Holy Ghost has a monopoly of the truth because it's the spirit of truth. Without the Holy Ghost, Martin Luther will never have been able to see the meaning, the significance of the just living by faith, of the truth of salvation and redemption from sin and from Satan and from the curse of the law. But then he just received a little light. John Wesley came on and received a little more light. And you read in the diary or journals of John Wesley and you see the activities of the Holy Ghost 
In fact, many of the gifts of the Holy Spirit manifested in his life because we read it in the journals how devils or demons were cast out, how people were healed miraculously, how the gift of faith was manifested. And all this came through uh, the Holy Ghost coming in within him and upon him. In fact, there was a time John Wesley and some people were having a prayer meeting. All of a sudden, the power of the Holy Ghost came upon them in such a mighty wave that for a time they didn't know what was happening. And eventually when the experience subsided and came down, they all shouted the praise of the Lord. But you know, it was still in a measure because the light was coming on gradually. And yet, the church at large, even at the time of Martin Luther or John Wesley or any of these other people, they were still ignorant about the Holy Ghost. I've told you before in church history, a man, a Presbyterian uh, minister, Charles G. Finney. But he, be he began to study the scriptures because he wasn't satisfied with what the church was telling him. He knew that there must be something more than the church is telling us today. And he got into this experience of the Holy Ghost and he had more. But in the 19th century, which means uh, more than 100 years ago, they could only have a measure because uh, the light came, but it was mixed with a little bit of ignorance and darkness and doubt and fear in their hearts. At the turn of this century, 1904, the world revival started and many people were looking up to God. And they were saying, oh God, send the Holy Ghost, send the Holy Ghost. In those meetings, there were not as many as we are here tonight because people were skeptical. All the books they had been reading had been telling them there is nothing you would have about the Holy Ghost anymore. The power has totally left the church. There were theologians that were teaching them that the last apostle died and power went away from the church. And when the New Testament was completed, when the council met and they decided by the leading of the Holy Ghost, the canon of the scriptures, after the, complete, the completion of the scriptures, then the Holy Ghost went away. But no, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost has come, he'll abide with you forever. He's never gone away. The church has turned its back on the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost is there all the time. All the time. And so in 1904, small groups of people started meeting together. Just about three, about four, about twelve, about twenty. And they were meeting in, you know, little, little corners, in, in homes. And many of them searching the scriptures, many of them searching their hearts, many of them praying and saying, Oh God, whatever you have for us in this age at this time, bring it upon us. They were hungry for the truth. They were thirsty. And they were getting saved, they were getting sanctified, and a few of them were getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. The revival expanded in 1906. And people were getting the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But to say if it started in 1906, why didn't you know about it in time? I'll tell you. The church at large, the trained uh, pastors, the priests and the scholars, when the revival started happening since 1904 to 1906, they became afraid because they were hearing that people were speaking in tongues. They were getting surprised. And because it would disturb and ruin and destroy their theology, they started writing against them. They write in the papers, they write in the books, they teach in the seminaries, they teach in the churches that know the Holy Ghost cannot move and operate like that today. The gifts of the Holy Ghost have gone and they have gone forever. And so people that would have rushed into the blessing, people that would have come into the blessing of the Holy Ghost, they were hindered. But the Pentecostal people, though few in number, though they were the scum of the earth, though they were ridiculed by all the other churches, they pressed on and they started examining the Bible. But as they were reading the Bible and examining the Bible and coming in little, little groups of prayer meetings, there were many books that were being written against them. And in magazines, you have, uh, you know, some cartoons that will be drawn, making jest of people having the Holy Ghost. And therefore, they oppressed them, they suppressed them, they kept them down. Until, you know, in many other parts of the world, like in Nigeria here. Around 1928, in Nigeria here, some people who had never read anything coming from outside about the Holy Ghost... They started reading the Bible because you realize in 1842, 
around the Badagri here. The CMS, uh, you know, missionaries uh, came from England and they brought the gospel and they started teaching us that the just shall live by faith. They started teaching us that there's something beyond idolatry. But since 1842, that they were teaching us the Bible, they didn't go beyond just teaching us that if you come to the Lord, God will forgive you and God will save you and remove you from idolatry. But, you know, from all those years, there were, you know, church people coming together. You have, uh, you know, the CMS Anglican Church. You have Methodist Church. You have all the other churches coming together. In this same theory, you know, the churches, uh, you know, they kept on growing in number and growing in knowledge. But the limitation of their knowledge was just about, you know, getting saved and knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. But around uh, the 20s, 1920s, some Nigerians on their own, they started searching the Bible here in, you know, Yoruba land. And independently, there were some groups in the east, in Igbo land. They too were searching the Bible. And at different times, without the people in the west, in Yoruba land, and known to the people in the east, the Holy Ghost also came upon them. But you know, these people were ignorant. They never studied the Greek or Hebrew or even the English Bible they read was difficulty. Miracles were taking place, and in many villages and many towns uh, in the West here, the gospel was being preached, and some denominations were established. The same thing in the East, some, uh, pe some places like Abakalik area, where the people, the missionaries who brought the gospel, they never could enter. But you know, in the 30s, I think, that the people who had this holy ghost on them, they went to those places, Abakalik area, and all those evil spirits were chased away. And the power of God moved in a mighty way. Evangelism took on a new dimension. Now the people in overseas, England, America, Canada, and Scotland, they were hearing about the revival in Nigeria and also in Africa. They started sending missionaries to Nigeria and Africa to teach us. Because, you see, they had gone into the scene uh, since about 1904, 1905, 1906. And so they came to Nigeria teaching us, telling us, well, you have to do everything decently and in order. You first get saved and, you know, some of them introduced holiness and sanctification. Some of them did not. Some of them talked about the Holy Ghost. And yet, even in Nigeria, the church at large... They were still, you know, going off from the Holy Ghost because uh, the missionaries still feared the idea of the Holy Ghost and the speaking in tongues and the miracle and the many things that were taking place. But eventually, you know, some small group, they still kept on. There was opposition, there was persecution, there was misunderstanding, there was ridicule, there was everything you could think about. Yet, the church was marching on. You know, it's really until around 1960, 61, 62, that you have people, even overseas, from various denominations, who became interested, Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutheran, the Anglican, the Methodists, even the Catholics, and many people, they became, you know, excited about what was going on among the people that are called Pentecostals, about speaking in tongues, about the Holy Ghost, about healing, about the gifts of the Spirit, and they started examining the Bible in small church groups. They remained Anglicans, but they, they were interested in the Holy Ghost. They remained Methodists, but they were interested in the Holy Ghost. They remained Baptists, but they were interested in the Holy Ghost. And they were searching. And that is what brought about what you will be hearing about, uh, you know, around you in some churches, charismatic groups. And these are uh, sincere Christians, by and large, who came together wanting to know more about the Holy Ghost. And so you'll be seeing things in the Bible that many of us have not known before about the Holy Ghost. But you see, with all these groups I've talked to you about, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and many of them just threw away their Bibles. They said the Holy Ghost has come, miracle has come, speaking in tongues has come, and therefore they did not know what the Holy Ghost will do when he came. And so you have, you know, many people who have received the Holy Ghost in very many places, and yet they are ignorant of what they have got. Power is residing in them. They don't know how to make use of that power. 
authorities in them. They don't know how to make use of that authority. There is insight, there is wisdom, there is revelation, there is glory, there is boldness, and there is faith in increased manner. They are the gifts of the Holy Ghost, but they do not know how to make use of these things because they do not sufficiently learn from the Word of God. That is why at this time the Lord is leading us so that if you have got the blessing of the Holy Ghost, you will know in what direction to go, what to do with the blessing that you have received. And tonight I'm just examining only 21 verses. Verses 1 to 21 of Acts chapter 2. And I'll be looking at the evidence, the enrichment, the effect, the excuse, the explanation, and the entrance into the blessing. Now, the evidence of the spirit baptism upon the believers. You know, they had been waiting because Jesus Christ had told them, Tarry in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He had told them, you must wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father will come upon you. Because uh, through the John baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. For ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and all Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. How long will this power remain in the church when it comes? Well, it will be until the end of the age, until the end of the world. What will, be, what will be the signs? When the Holy Ghost will come, well, when the Holy Ghost is come, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak in new tongues, they shall take off serpents, if they drink any deadly sin, they shall not hurt them, and they shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so the disciples and the apostles were waiting. And one day passed, they were still in prayer, they were still united together. Two days and three days, four days, five days, six, seven, eight, nine. On the tenth day, it was the day of Pentecost. A day when many Jews came together from all countries where they had been scattered because they remembered their home. They remembered Jerusalem, where God had placed his name. And they were going to worship the Almighty God because he had told them, three times in the year must your males appear before me and on this day they came together from many places and it was on that day when the disciples were waiting with one accord that the holy ghost came upon them and here we see the evidence when he came i'm reading acts chapter 2 from verse 1 and when the day of pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place i told you before that the condition of receiving this holy ghost one, there will be unanimous obedience. They obey the Lord. They were with one accord in one place. Two, there will be unity, united prayer and worship. There will be oneness, unconditional oneness. There will be humility. No big guy and small you among them. In honor, they esteemed one another. There was humility in them. And so they were ready for that day. And they were ready for the coming of the Holy Ghost. And suddenly, there came a sound of a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloving tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance this was the evidence when the holy ghost came upon them one, that was a great sound, a loud noise. It was like an earthquake. It was like a rushing mighty wind. I told you last week, it was like the breath of God, the blast coming from heaven. Because the Greek word means blast or breath of God. It was like a rushing blast that came within the house and the noise of it filled the whole house where they were prayerfully sitting. And then there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And then we are told they were all filled. All filled. The word all shows the faithfulness of God. He promised everyone and all the people that fulfilled the condition. They received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And today, all the people that come expecting, come in faith, come with open heart, open mind. And they have settled all their account with God and they fulfilled the condition. All of them, they received the Holy Ghost. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues, languages. The Greek is glossa. That's the word from which uh, the Pentecostals and Charismatics have got the word glossolalia. Because laleo means to speak in Greek. And glossa means 
language and speaking in unknown language they have coined they have joined two, those two words together to mean glossolalia and it means now you are speaking in tongues because the holy ghost has come upon you they were all filled with the holy ghost and they began to speak with other languages other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance now these were real languages because the Greek word I've told you is real language. A language that is intelligible. A language that, you know, some people will hear and they will understand. Look at it from verse 6. When this was noised abroad. Actually, the Greek means there, when the noise came abroad. Phony. The noise. The sound. In a singular it was like just a united uh, type of noise and sound that came upon them. When this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Why? Because, the, because every man had them speak in his own language. The same word glosser. In his own language. In his own language. When the Spirit came upon them, they spoke in a real language. They didn't learn it before. They didn't know the language before. But the Holy Ghost came upon them and gave them utterance. And when they opened their mouth and yielded their voice to what was coming out of their spirit, it turned out to be a language. And the people that had them understood the language. That's the evidence. And in verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? What does that mean? That's like saying, are not all these who speak illiterate? They never learnt the language. And you know, if, if you know anything about the Jews, especially Palestine, at the time of Jesus Christ and at the time of the apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ, the Galileans were counted as illiterate, uncultured people, unrefined people, uninformed people. And so they were surprised. These people who have never traveled out of their community speaking a foreign language. You know, it's like a, a man, I met him myself, I saw him myself. He's called a Brother Silas in East Africa. When I was in East Africa, we talked together and he was so surprised to hear of the testimonies of what God is doing with us here in Nigeria in this ministry. You know, he was an unbeliever and he was educated, he was uh, working in an office and he could speak English. But there were some groups of people meeting together in, um, in a prayer meeting. And at night... These people were praying. And uh, in his own house, because the way they were praying was very near his own house, he opened his windows, he could hear them. He heard one of them hear, um, speaking fluent English. Like uh, the person had gone to university. The person was praying and speaking English. He was surprised. He put on his clothes. He walked out of the door. And he traced that voice. And he peeped and he saw them. And he saw the person speaking English. The person was a stark illiterate. Complete illiterate. The person couldn't tell an A from a B when written on paper. And yet was speaking English. So he said, I'm going to find out. He went uh, the second day at their prayer meeting because every night they were praying. He went there. And he quietly sat down. They sang, he wasn't interested. They preached, he wasn't interested. He was waiting for the time of prayer because he wanted to locate the person speaking English in prayer. And uh, after the singing, after the clapping, after the, after the uh, message, and now they said, now we're going to worship the Lord, we're going to pray. And he started praying. He didn't close his eyes, he opened his eyes. He was looking around, looking for the person speaking English. And the Holy Ghost came upon that individual again and started speaking in tongues. And again was speaking English and went near the person. Tiptoed and got near and looked at the person and saw that this one is number one illiterate. And then after the meeting, he invited the pastor and said, How do you do for this illiterate speaking English? And the pastor said, we don't teach them. The Holy Ghost gives them the language. That is what is called speaking in tongues. He said, is that speaking in tongues? How can I have it? He said, you must be born again first. He became born again. Then he was sanctified, became holy, and then was baptized in the Holy Ghost. He didn't speak English because he had been speaking English before. God gave him another language. And he started a ministry of healing and deliverance. And God started using him in a mighty way. What drew him to the gospel? Speaking in tongues. A real language. And in verse 7 here, they were all amazed. 
they were all amazed and surprised and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which be Galileans? How hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? And so you can see that the evidence that we're given here is that they spoke in tongues. In verse 11, Creates and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They knew it, will be, they knew it was God that gave them the language because, you see, they were praising God, glorifying the Lord. And in other passages of Acts of the Apostles, when the Holy Ghost came, they spoke in tongues. Uh, let's see a few of them in Acts chapter 10. From verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which had the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured the gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, for they heard them speak with tongues, again, languages, and they magnified God. In um, Acts chapter 19, I'm reading there just verse 6. Acts chapter 19, verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. They spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. Now, when they received the Holy Ghost in the early church, that's how they knew the Holy Ghost had come. That's the evidence that they saw. And um, I dare tell you that this is a scriptural sign. It's a uniform sign. It's a sign that is available to everybody when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. If you believe in miracles, that one is not a surprise to you. If you believe that with God all things are possible, that will not worry you at all. If you believe that it was so in the Acts of the Apostles and it can be so even today, that will not be a problem to you at all because what God did at that time is still able to do today. I have seen many people who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and they, they received the baptism with the sign, scriptural sign of speaking in tongues. When I was seeking the experience as a minister of God, who didn't believe that everybody must speak in tongues, and he said, well, brother, don't worry yourself. I believe that you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. It's just that, you know, the sign you feel you want to see, you have not seen. If I accepted what he said, I would never be able to launch ahead, and I would not have been able to keep on until the power came upon my life. But, you know, I kept on praying until I received exactly what they got in the Acts of the Apostles. Because you see today, if you'll just believe God and keep on praying and depend upon him, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And the same evidence of the Spirit in the Acts of the Apostles will come upon you as well, which is speaking with tongues. I must speak a little about the enrichment in the Spirit. We've talked about the evidence of the Spirit, not the enrichment in the Spirit. And I want you to really pay close attention because... I've told you that the church has been limited in the understanding about the Holy Ghost. Now, when the Holy Ghost has come, we've told you about the evidence, but that's where many people stop. They never go beyond evidence to the enrichment in the Spirit. What's the enrichment when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost? What are the great things that come upon your life? Number one. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, after that initial evidence, there will be power in your preaching. Because immediately after this, Peter began to preach. Number one, in his preaching, we can see that there was illumination and inspiration. There was power, there was faith, there was boldness. All things came together. There was wisdom. And in verse 37, come and see the effect of the preaching. After the Holy Ghost came upon him. Acts 2.37 Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were pricked in their heart. That's Holy Ghost preaching. Because Jesus had said, when the Holy Ghost is coming, will convict the world of sin. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Now in verse 43, another enrichment. When the Holy Ghost comes upon your life. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Many signs and wonders. Number one, your preaching becomes powerful. Number two, signs and wonders attend your preaching. The Holy Ghost begins to work in partnership with you when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. In chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, being filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by that name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, my brother, my sister, as boldness. He could tell these rulers that they crucified Jesus Christ. This was a weak Peter, the fainting Peter, the fearful Peter that denied Jesus Christ on the day of his crucifixion, in the night of his trial. But now, the Holy Ghost had come upon him. What was enrichment? Boldness. He could challenge them. And then in... Verse 13, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they are... When they, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Boldness, that's part of the enrichment. The evidence is speaking in tongues, but the enrichment is just many sided and many fold. And in verse 33, Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Great power. That's the enrichment. In chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Single-handedly, he went to this uh, city of Samaria. Now think about it. No publicity, no music, no orchestra, no co-workers. Single-handedly, because they were driven away from Jerusalem because of the persecution. And Philip went down to Samaria, and he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse 7, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taking with pulses, and that were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in the city. That's the enrichment that comes upon you when the Holy Ghost is upon you. And then in chapter 11 of Acts, from verse 22, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the church. Your converts will be numbered in the hundreds and thousands when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. What took you a year to do before might take you just a week or a day to do when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The converts were multiplied. And, you know, there are many things in the scripture that uh, we see as enrichment in uh, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14, verse 2. You know, after you have received the initial evidence of speaking in tongues... There is nothing stopping you. In fact, the Bible positively encourages you to keep on speaking in tongues in your devotional prayer life. Because after you have got the Holy Ghost upon you and you have got that initial scriptural sign of speaking in tongues, as you yield your tongue in faith, as you continue in faith, you can still in your devotional prayer life continue to speak in tongues. And when you do that, the Bible says there is a type of enrichment coming upon your life. First Corinthians chapter 14 verse 2. For 
He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, that is, in a language you never learnt before, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. That's why when you are speaking in tongues, there may not be people around you that can understand. Because you are not speaking unto men, you are speaking unto God. In fact, your own mind and your own brain, you may not understand what you are saying. But yet your spirit is being edified and you are speaking secrets, divine secrets. That's what uh, the word mystery there means. And in verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, builds himself up. That means your courage will increase, your comfort will increase, your faith will increase. That's what it means for you to be edified. You are being built up in your most holy faith as you are speaking in tongues in your devotional prayer life. But he that prophesies edifies the church. It's saying... When you speak in a language that people can hear in prophecy, then other people that hear will understand. And they will be edified. They will be built up. Their faith will be encouraged. But when you are speaking in tongues and nobody is understanding you, your spirit is being built up, encouraged, edified. You are growing. And in verse 14, For if I pray in a unknown tongue, if I pray in a language I didn't know before, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. What does that mean? When you pray with your understanding, your brain can understand, your mind can understand. And therefore, your mind profits when you are speaking the language you know, the language you understand. Your mind profits and your spirit also profits. Now please understand, and this is important. You know, when you are praying for salvation, you prayed in English, or you prayed in Yoruba, or you prayed in Igbo, or you prayed in your vernacular language, and your soul was saved, your spirit was recreated. So never say, if I pray with my understanding, my spirit will never benefit. Never say that. When you prayed for salvation, you prayed in your normal language, and your spirit was recreated, your soul was saved, you were benefited. When you pray for healing, your body is benefited. Your faith is encouraged also. And your understanding is also benefited. And you were healed. Your body, your body got a uh, part of the blessing. But you know, when you are speaking in tongues, it's altogether spiritual. Except you can interpret it, it's only your spirit, your inner man. That is benefiting, that is profiting and being edified. That's what verse 14 is saying. It says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Well, does that mean I should stop uh, speaking in tongues then, since uh, my brain or my mind doesn't understand? No, not at all. Look at verse 18. Paul the Apostle says, I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than ye all. Every time Paul prayed, he will, he will make sure that he speaks in tongues in his devotional prayer life. Yet, in verse 19, yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. And so he's telling us that when we speak in tongues, we benefit our spirit prayers. Our spirit benefits and is edified. And now we go back to Acts chapter 2. And very quickly, I want you to see the effect on the sinners. The Holy Ghost came, it was noised about what was the effect on the sinners. Let's see. Verse 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, I told you the Greek use there is funny, and uh, when this noise came abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. What was the effect? One, the multitude were, they were brought together. Two, they became confounded. They were surprised. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't uh, unravel it with their mind, with their brain. In verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled. That's the effect on them. One, they came together. Two, they were confounded. Three, they were amazed. And four, they, they marveled. They were surprised at what they were seeing and hearing. 
saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which be Galileans? How hear we every man? It made them inquisitive. They were now asking questions. That's the effect when a miracle happens. That's the effect when, uh, you know, the Spirit comes upon you and then you begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. How hear we every man in our own language, in our own tongue, when we were born? And they, be, they begin to tell us uh, the nations from which they came and the various languages they spoke. Listen to me, look up here. When we receive the Holy Ghost baptism, we may receive on the same day. We may receive in the same church. We may receive sitting on the same bench. And listen to me, we may not speak the same unknown language. The language you speak may be different from the language another person is speaking because these all received together at the same time in the same upper room were in the same prayer meeting. And yet, these many people were hearing the various and different languages. Which languages? Verse 9, Persians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and in Pontus and in Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We all do hear them speak in our tongues, in our languages. The wonderful works of God. Now you see when you speak in tongues and listen to me. This is what makes us to know whether it's of the devil or it's of God. If you are praising God, if you are glorifying God, then we know that this is of God because the devil is not in the business of praising God. They were praising the wonderful works of God. That agrees with Exodus chapter 15 verse 11 because we are told that God is glorious in praises. A glorious is fearful in power. Glorious in praises. The wonderful works of God. That agrees with the Psalms because we are told in the Psalms, I will make mention of the works of the wonderful works of God. That agrees with the prophets because all the prophets were doing, they were pointing people to the wonderful works of God. And so you see, because they were praising God, the the people that were hearing them, they knew that this is of God. And you know when you are speaking in tongues, anybody that has a spiritual insight and discernment of spirits can really tell whether you are being acted upon by, listen to me, either your human spirit or by the Holy Spirit or by an evil spirit. There are three types of spirits, human spirit, Holy Spirit and, human, and the evil spirit. You know, if it is um, evil spirit, you'll be tense. Your facial expression will, will look destructive and fearful. There'll be, there'll be no blending of joy and happiness and grace and mercy and peace and just a heavenly breeze upon you because, you know, it's an evil spirit that comes to steal and to destroy and to kill. A person can be speaking in tongues and if it's all tense up, if it's all been destroyed, uh, you know, knocking his head on the wall or knocking uh, his uh, hand on the chair and he wants to break his brood or he, he's taking a knife and wants to hurt himself, wants to hurt another person, that cannot be Holy Ghost. That has to be evil spirit because, uh, you know, evil spirits also act and they activate in, in various meetings. Now, when it is human spirit, now the human spirit may be bold naturally. The human spirit may be audacious uh, naturally. The human spirit may, you know, just do some things that are terrifying normally. And when you, when you try to stop him, he will not stop. Because he's, uh, on, in, on his own, he's just naturally stubborn. That's not the Holy Ghost, that's just the human spirit. When it is the Holy Spirit, and uh, you'll soon see. They were speaking in tongues and all these people came around and they still went on speaking in tongues. Do you know, Peter knew when the people came to the meeting. He knew when they came to the upper room. He knew when they all gathered around the house and they were wondering and they were saying, how are these people? In fact, he heard what the jesters and the mockers were saying because he was still conscious. When it is evil spirit, you are not conscious. If you're a woman, you are not conscious, your rapper will go one way and, you know, your Bible will go another way. And when we ask you now, uh, when you come down eventually and we say, well, didn't you know what you are doing? You say, no, the Holy Ghost took over. I didn't know when my rapper left me. That's not Holy Ghost, that's evil spirit. 
Peter knew when they came around. And you know, immediately Peter stood up to preach. All the other people taught instantaneously, speaking in tongues. Why? Because we are told in the Bible, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. If it's Holy Spirit, it's gentle, it's normal, it's beautiful, it gives you pleasure, it's joyful, and it edifies, it edifies the spirit. You know, when you feel speaking in tongues, uh, if you speak in tongues in your devotional prayer time, if it's the Holy Ghost, when you finish, there'll be a refreshing. There'll be a rest. There'll be a calm. There'll be a comfort within your soul. That's the Holy Ghost because you see, it's a comforter. And I told you the word last week means paraclete. And uh, it means the comforter, the counselor. It means the um, helper, the advocate, the strengthener, the standby. And you'll be strengthened. You, you'll, you'll feel calm because that's exactly what we're told in um, Isaiah chapter 28. Let's see that. Isaiah chapter 28. Concerning the promise of the Holy Ghost coming upon us and giving us the speaking in tongues. This is the effect. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 11. For with stammering leaves. And another tongue will he speak unto these people. With stammering lips and another tongue. Will he speak unto these people to whom he said, This is a rest wherewith they may cause the weary to rest, and this is a refreshing. You know, when you are speaking in tongues, if it's the Holy Ghost, after finishing it will give you rest, an abiding rest, a calm. There will be no storm, there will be no confusion. There will be no commotion inside your heart. There will be a refreshing because it's rivers of living water. Rivers of refreshing water coming out and gushing out of you. Now you're asking the question, how do we know that where we have read in Isaiah chapter 28 verses 11 and 12? How do we know it's referring to the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm reading there from verse 21 in the law it is written with men of other tongues and with other leaves will I speak unto this people and yet for all that they will hear they will not hear me says the Lord wherefore signs uh, tongues are a sign not to them that believe but to them that believe not so you can see that uh, verse 21 is quoting exactly Isaiah 28 verses 11 and 12 and so, when it's evil spirit, you are tense, destroys you, gives you unrest, wants to lead you to commit suicide, wants to lead you to jump down from the pavement or from the balcony, wants to tell you to run out and, you know, remove your clothes, wants to tell you to, you know, go on the sea and experiment walking on the sea, that's evil spirit. But when it's the Holy Ghost... Well, it's not like that. Now let's come back to Acts chapter 2. The excuse of some sinners. You know, the other, spe the other people. Uh, look at verse 12. And when they were, all, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meanest this? And this is the excuse of some people. Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. They heard them speaking in other languages and they said, well, they are drunk. And now comes the explanation. Now we're told in the Bible that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. And that's why they said they are drunk of new wine. But now Peter rose up to give the explanation. Explanation of the saints. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. And said unto them, Ye men of Judea, look up at me here. If you are not humble, it's difficult for God to use you. You know, sometimes you have received the Holy Ghost. And uh, you, you have spoken in tongues. And you come to a prayer meeting. And when you come into that prayer meeting, what you do is that you know that people are around and you want to impress them, to make them know that you have got the Holy Ghost and you speak with tongues and you start speaking in tongues so that the people may see it will not have power. 
there will be no anointing, there will be no unction. It will be just your human spirit uh, repeating what you have said before. It will not be fresh, it will not be new. There will be no power coming with it. And uh, if you are so if you are so foolish, if you are so proud, the Holy Ghost will soon leave you. Because they will know that you just want to use him to brag. What I'm saying is that Peter, when the, when the people came around and he wanted to preach to them, he wasn't speaking in tongues now. He now spoke in the normal language, Aramaic. He was speaking to them, when, which they could all hear. Ye men of Judea, stop the speaking in tongues. And then all the other people, no usher needed to carry anybody out. While Peter was preaching, there was uh, nobody like, you know, any of the other apostles still wanting to show power, still speaking in tongues. No, no. Yes, they had fulfilled the condition. I mean, these people were sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And so when uh, we have the same thing, we should know that the spirits of the prophet is under the prophet. And oh, he rose up and said, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in, at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. The third hour of the day means 9 a.m. And he was telling them, Now, you Jews, don't you know that no Jew will normally eat uh, before 9 o'clock in the morning? eat or drink, especially on a Sabbath day, on a feast day like the day of Pentecost, because that was the time they ought to give to morning devotion, and no Jew will ever go out to eat or drink at that time. So he was telling them, we are not drunk. And he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He said, this is scriptural. You know, if you are not able to back up whatever you are doing with the Holy Scriptures, then you should stop doing it. If anything you do, ask no backing, ask no support from the Bible, then you stop it because you know, the Holy Ghost will not do anything that is out of the Bible. But Peter said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Let me just interpret that to you in a short time, because the time is gone. It says, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, and when that spirit comes upon you, in the day, you see visions. In the night, you dream dreams. You say, does, uh, uh, does God give us dreams today? You better believe it. It's in the Bible. It says, when the Holy Ghost has come, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions, especially old men shall dream dreams. But of course you realize it's connected with the Holy Ghost when the Spirit comes upon you. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out my Spirit in those days of, of my Spirit and uh, they shall prophesy. There's nothing like receiving the Holy Ghost and sitting at home. You receive the Holy Ghost, you will prophesy. You'll proclaim, you'll, you'll preach. That's what he's telling you. And you'll preach with power. You will declare the wonderful works of God. You say, how did this uh, reference ap apply to them? Well, you know that they said, we hear every one of them uh, speaking and um, telling of the wonderful works of God. What is that? They were prophesying. They were proclaiming the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the power of God. The Holy Ghost had come, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor or smoke. That's uh, talking about... The time of the second coming of the Lord. And uh, you as a Bible scholar, you must praise God for that verse because it's telling you that this will continue until the second coming of the Lord. Until the very inauguration of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the millennial kingdom. So the people who are saying that the miracles are no more there, the Holy Ghost is no more there because, you know, everything is gone when the apostles died. We must tell them it will continue until I will show you. Because, you see, there is no full stop between verse 18 and verse 19. And the first word in verse 19 is and, which means a connecting word, which means it will continue until the millennium. Once the Holy Ghost has come into the church, and that Holy Ghost and power, miracles will continue. And then it says in verse 20, and the sun shall be 
uh, turn into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the explanation. Now the entrance. And uh, the word ready is the word I'm using to help you. R-E-A-D-Y. Now already we know that this promise is, you know, for everyone because it's in the church until the very last time. In fact, uh, Peter said, it shall come to pass in the last days. And then he said, in those days, all these things will happen. Our means recognize your need. If you are not hungry, if you are not thirsty, for the Holy Ghost to come. The Holy Ghost will not come upon people who are negligent and lazy and prayerless and are not interested. But you must recognize your need. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst, because they shall be full of what they are thirsting after. And it says in the Bible, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Because as the scriptures have said, have said, that it will come upon you and it will be upon you, it will be coming out of you as rivers of living water. This is pay concerning the spirit we did that believe on him must receive. Because the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because he was not yet glorified. But now, as we are thirsty, as you know your need, you recognize your need. It, the Holy Ghost will be poured upon you in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. You have to be thirsty for the Holy Ghost. And floods upon the dry ground. I will pour upon, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. So that means you recognize your need. Number two, expect the blessing. Already we're told in Acts chapter 2 verse 39. For the promise is unto you. Well, if it's unto you, expect it. Expect it. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Then ask in faith. Ask in faith. Ask in faith. If ye be evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive and ye shall have. And so we have to ask in faith. And then it says you drink from him. You drink from him. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now if I give you a cup of water, and you get it from me, you receive it from me, you hold that cup of water in your hand, and then you look at me and you say, help me, my brother, help me to drink it. I say, but it's in your hand. Start drinking now, you say, but help me, help me. I say, if you are foolish enough to hold water in your hand, I know how to, you don't know how to drink, bye-bye. If you have recognized your need, you are thirsty and you are hungry for it, he'll give you. If you are expecting the blessing, then the promise is something. If you are asking in faith, what you ask in faith, he'll give. Because you are asking in faith and then you receive, you must drink and then yield in his hand. Yield. Because, you know, John said, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that is coming after me is mightier than high. Whose shoes slash it, I'm not able to lose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now you picture yourself, if you have been baptized in water, the minister is holding you, and he wants to dip you inside the water. And it's, as he dips you inside the water, you are struggling with him. You strengthen your muscles. You strengthen your joints. He wants to bend you down. You don't yield. Then you cannot be baptized in water. And you know, it's the same thing. John is telling us that as people yield to me when I'm baptizing them in water, so must you yield in the hands of Jesus Christ. You yield your tongue unto him. You yield your vocal cords unto him. He is not going to force you to speak in tongues. You know, sometimes uh, the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you're speaking in English and you know, you're praising the Lord, you're asking in faith and the Holy Ghost comes according to your expectation and then your tongue is changing but then you are struggling with him to stop it and you know, to you know, struggle to speak the English. If you know you are going to keep on struggling, well, he cannot force it upon you because he'll give you the utterance but you will do the speaking in tongues. So you recognize your need, you expect the blessing, you ask in faith, you drink from him, and then you yield in his hand. And if we yield as people who are baptized in water, yield to the people baptizing them, then we shall receive the blessing. Rise up and let us pray.
Already the inspired apostle has said the promise is unto you. Tonight the promise is unto you. And right where you are, if you have recognized your need, if you are hungry and thirsty, if you are expecting the blessing, if you are asking in faith, then you can drink. You drink with ease. You drink in faith. And right there, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Then you can yield in his hand and then he will give you the initial sign when he comes in. Expect the blessing to come upon you.